My guest today is Mary Everstadt. Her two books we'll be discussing are How the West Really Lost God and Primal Screams, How the Sexual Revolution Created Identity Politics. Mary Everstadt is a senior fellow at the Ethics and Public Policy Center. She has written widely for magazines and newspapers, among them First Things, Policy Review, The Weekly Standard, The Wall Street Journal, and Commentary. Her previous books to these two include Home Alone America, Adam and Eve After the Pill, and the satire The Loser Letters. Okay, so this conversation was very interesting in as much as that she's uh, kind of an old school conservative. I'm not sure what label she would actually use. I didn't ask her that, but you know, and, and as you know, I'm not. So we had uh, basically most of the conversation was us disagreeing up about a lot of different things, although we did find some common ground. Uh, so we cover the decline of religion, which she th- sees as a bad thing and I see as a good thing. <laughs> uh, her reversal causal thesis is that it's the breakdown of the family that led to the decline of religion, not the secularization thesis that most sociologists of religion uh, uh, try to um, attest. In any case, uh, so we go through all those arguments and then what is a nuclear family? What's a natural family? What, what about extended families? And communities and clans and tribes. And, and so we get into a little bit of history there. We talk about Joe Henrik's weird, although she hadn't read his book, um, The Weirdest People on Earth, the Western Educated Industrialized Rich Democratic, and how the Catholic Church launched this whole nuclear family idea in its prohibition of marrying of cousins marrying each other. And that kind of broke the family down from these larger communal structures to more of what we think of as the nuclear family, which I think she a- agrees is the problem. That is to say, we, we need, we need a, a larger community of social support. Anyway, then we get into policy issues, and we spend a lot of time on abortion. Uh, she's pro-life, and I'm pro-choice, and I try to talk her into the position. Of course, I, no one rarely changes their minds on these subjects, but uh, and then we wrap up talking about uh, to what extent you can structure a society with without religion. I think we can. I think we should. She obviously disagrees with that, so we go through all that. Anyway, it was a super interesting conversation. I like to have conversations with people with whom I don't agree with because they're more interesting. And uh, and as always, if you appreciate the podcast, please support us at skeptic.com slash donate. This podcast is supported by the Skeptic Society. We're a 501c3 nonprofit, so your support of the podcast is tax deductible. Again, skeptic.com slash donate. And our sponsor is Wondrium, the former great courses, Wondrium, W-O-N-D-R-I-U-M, Wondrium.com slash Shermer will get you the free one month trial. It's a subscription service in which you can access um, their uh, great courses, their uh, programs uh, and documentaries and uh, documentary series that they offer. And you can access that all online digitally stream it through your phone, listen to it while you're driving or hiking or cycling or uh, uh, doing chores around the house. I, I consume a ton of their content. So they are our sponsor of the show. So go, again, go to wondrium.com slash Shermer to get your one month free trial and then see how it goes. Give it a try. I uh, love consuming their content. It's a great way to, to be an autodidact. Okay. Thanks for listening to the show. Thanks for your support. Hi, nice to see you. Good morning. Thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having me, Michael. I will have introduced your the two books your publisher sent me, uh, How the West Really Lost God and Primal Screams, How sexual uh, Re- how the Sexual Revolution Created Identity pol- Politics. I will have given those a proper introduction along with your bio. Uh, just the way this came about, I had, uh, I had had one of their other authors on the podcast, I forget who it was, and they asked if I wanted to have you on. I said, yeah, sure. Uh, in a way, because I know we differ on certain characteristics and features and beliefs and so on. Um, and I'm tired of talking to people I agree with because that's boring. I already know what I think. And, and if, if somebody agrees with me, then I know what they think. And, and, uh, I think it's a lot more interesting to talk to people that I don't necessarily agree with on all things, uh, because that's where the action is. Uh, and I think it's, it's, it's quite possible to have, uh, thoughtful conversations with people who may disagree with uh, on some things. There are some things I, I agree with you on. So, but before we get into all that, I uh, let's let's give uh, our listeners who don't know you uh, just a, a brief biography or or your life your life story in a, in, a, in a couple paragraphs. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. 
Uh, well, I uh, grew up in upstate New York in a series of small towns uh, scattered across the central part of the state. Um, my stepfather was a blue collar worker and he would move for work. So I ended up in 10 or so of these little hamlets and villages, went to a series of public schools, grew up with brothers, half brothers, half siblings, step siblings, etc. cetera. Uh, and I was bookish and I ended up uh, in a scholarship house at Cornell University called Telluride House, which is one of the last remaining merit scholarship um, opportunities. And it's a place that over the generations, a number of names you would know have passed through, like Francis Fukuyama, who was 10 years ahead of me or so, and lots of other people. <clears throat> it was generally a very progressive place. And I studied it closely and learned a lot about the way the left thinks and the way that liberals think. Uh, I ended up with a double major in philosophy and government, and I thought I would go to graduate school for philosophy. And I was all set to go to Princeton when something happened um, that changed my course. I uh, got very sick my senior year, and I had to take five incompletes. So that meant a year off school. And uh, I moved to New York City with the idea of being a waitress or, you know, seeing if I could write <clears throat> while I finished my schoolwork. And I ended up going to work for Irving Kristol, uh, who was then editor of the Public Interest magazine. And I made a very corrupting discovery, which was that people would pay me to write and I wouldn't have to go to school anymore. Uh, that set me on a very different path. I ended up doing speech writing for Jean Kirkpatrick when she was our ambassador to the United Nations, uh, then for uh, George Schultz when he was Secretary of State, um, and then a series of essays and, as you know, a bunch of books after about a 15-year hiatus when I was um, busy with our four children. Uh, and I think I've taken a very contrarian path, and I hope that's something that we can get into. Oh yes, absolutely. No, what a what a fascinating uh, career path. Yeah, it's hard to track that in terms of like giving uh, undergraduates some guidance. Like, here, you should do what I did. It's like, how do you do that? How do you get a job <laughs> under Gene Kirkpatrick and uh, George Schultz? I mean, you know, there I I do think just parenthetically that how lives turn out uh, is very much more random than we think. That is, there's little contingent bifurcations along the way that are completely unpredictable. You know, you went left instead of right. You went this class. You took that class instead of that one. You met this person that led you to that person that led you to Gene Kirkpatrick or whatever. That would be hard to duplicate. And yet, in hindsight, you look back and you think, "Oh, well, it was all sort of meant to be." And here's how I ended up. Uh, and you know, there's sort of a I interesting uh, kind of a bias there in, in how we look at biography. But that, that's a fascinating background. Yes. Um, so I, uh, yeah, I did. I consulted one of my my sociolo sociology of religion. Friends, former gra uh, former graduate student of mine, um, Kevin M McCaffrey, who studies this stuff, and he really likes your work. He said he he, he thinks that sociologists have not taken as seriously as they should your hypotheses, uh, particularly so the decline of religion as it relates to the family. That that as a hypothesis, uh, you know, needs much more exploration. So let's start there. Uh, your 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 thesis is that um, that religion is in decline, and that the and that that is associated with the breakdown of the family. So you have A is associated with B, and as we know in correlational studies, A may be the cause of B, but on the other hand, maybe B is the cause of A. Maybe, the, uh, in your case, the breakdown of the family is what led to religious decline, not religious decline leading to the breakdown of the family. But on the other hand, as we know in, in the study of causality, maybe A and B are both caused by something else, C. Or D and E, like you know, industrialization, or secularization, or the digital economy, or you know, whatever. There could be half a dozen other variables, and that A and B are not causally connected. So, let's go from there and just ha how you uh, kind of think about those things and tease apart those variables. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> in how the West really lost God, I march through in pretty short order, but I hope convincing order the predominant explanations for Western secularization. And I'm making clear that I'm talking about Christianity, uh, not about Islam, not about Judaism, but about the decline of Western Christianity. Now, there are some 
theories about why we see this drop in church attendance, this uh, drop in the number of people who profess to believe in God, etc. I don't think any of the going theories really get at the heart of the matter. So, for example, there is a theory according to which <clears throat> we got rich, and when we got rich, we didn't need God. In other words, material prosperity explains secularization. And the problem with that theory is that the counterfactuals are too obvious. So, for example, you have, uh, in the case of Victorian London, I spend a number of pages talking about the work that's been done on religiosity in Victorian London, because it's very important. What it shows is that the richer people were, the better off they were, the higher their social class, the more likely they were to profess religious belief. We see that same pattern uh, in parts of the United States today. There are, of course, fabled precincts that are God-free, um, including most of our university campuses. But if you look at the United States uh, on the whole, what you see is that people are, again, more likely to profess religious belief and to practice religious belief as you go up the social ladder. So there are more examples we could throw in there, but I think uh, that's enough to shed serious um, doubt on the thesis that material prosperity explains secularization. Okay, if that theory doesn't work, what's next? Some people have argued uh, that the world wars of the 20th century contributed decisively to secularization because after the carnage of the 20th century, how could you believe in God? I find that, <clears throat> that explanation very compelling. I've been to Auschwitz and, you know, at Auschwitz, you can still see a pool full of ashes 70 plus years later. Um, it's very hard to contemplate something like that and to think of a benevolent God. And yet this theory, although intuitively appealing, also doesn't hold up against the evidence. Because what the evidence shows is that after the, the end of World War II, up until the early 1960s, there was in fact a religious boom that swept the Western world. And this was true in some places that are very secular today, um, in Australia, New Zealand, across Europe. Church going was up, marriage was up, family <clears throat> formation was up. We are familiar with this uh, as the years of the baby boom. <clears throat> but in fact, the baby boom was preceded by and accompanied by this religious boomlet across the West. So if the world wars were responsible for secularization, why would we see this outpouring, this new outpouring of, of uh, Christian belief? Those are, I think, two theories that we can put aside in thinking about how the West really lost God. What I offer is instead a, an alternative theory, which is that the sexual revolution of the early 1960s caused formidable changes in family formation. And these changes, for a number of different reasons, have contributed to the decline of religious practice and the decline of religious belief. It's very suggestive, Michael, that every historian, <clears throat> excuse me, every historian of secularization looks at the year 1963 and says, well, what happened in 1963? Because the West was becoming increasingly religious until then. That's when we begin to see the fall off. I think what happened in 1963 is obvious. It is when the sexual revolution begins to take hold, divorce rates begin to skyrocket, uh, cohabitation is on the rise, eventually abortion becomes legal. All of these things end up splintering the natural family. And although these things are hailed as liberations, they have had a, a dark downside, I argue, not only when it comes to religion, but for now, let's just stick to the case of religion. So why would these changes in family formation affect religiosity? I think for a number of reasons. Number one, we live in a world where uh, 
almost half of American children now grow up without their biological dad in the house. It is harder to explain the traditional Christian story of God, uh, the benevolent father, to children who don't know what a benevolent father looks like. That's one small hurdle. I think it's a big hurdle for pastors and priests. Um, <clears throat> but that's one very prosaic way in which you can see the world that the sexual revolution created is putting obstacles in the path of religious faith. Or take, take another way in which that happens, also pedestrian, uh, but real. When parents live apart from each other, typically they have shared custody of a child. A child is not in a continuous home. This interrupts just the very basic question of when does the kid go to Sunday school or when does the kid go to CCD? Uh, so that's also a contributing factor. I get into um, other aspects of this argument in the book, as you know, but I think, again, intuitively, just looking at the world around us, we can see that the way that we have come to live has contributed to religious decline. We live without the immediate horizons of birth and death. In other words, in places where families are small or non-existent, in the medicalized, advanced Western world, uh, it is possible for, say, a woman to go through to middle age without ever having held a baby. It is possible uh, not to stand near a grave and see a coffin lowered into it in an age uh, where cremation is common. All of these things, but the possibility of a transcendental horizon more at arm's reach than it used to be. We aren't used to the ongoing rhythms of birth and death uh, that our ancestors knew. We are far more atomized people since the sexual revolution. And I think that explains a great deal of religious decline. Right, interesting. All right, let's uh, drill down on that a little bit. But I do think the Auschwitz example, it's a, it's a good just-so story, but it's just that, I mean, theologians will argue that the problem of theodicy, why bad things happen, especially to good people, uh, well, God gave us free will. And in the case of war and genocide, those are just people making bad decisions or evil people or whatever. Um, that's the whole point of the, uh, of the drama of the human condition. God gave us uh, life and then the freedom to choose good and evil, and we are fallen creatures, and the Nazis just committed evil deeds, and God has nothing to do with it because that's the whole point of being here. So I, I, I can see why that would not actually be a causal factor. I mean, of course, we know people, particularly Jews, who abandon uh, Judaism because of the Holocaust, understandably so. But as a, as a causal factor, I don't think that's necessary. Um, let, let's just think about for a moment um, the, the argument that religion is in decline. So, for example, in, uh, I was researching this in 2000 when I wrote my book, How We Believe. So here I used uh, uh, Fink and Stark's book, The Churching of America. So this 1776 to 1990, I think this was published in about 96. <clears throat> the authors point out that for the past two centuries, American church membership rates have risen from a paltry 17% at the time of the revolution to 34% by the middle of the 19th century to over 60% today. So that would be in the 1990s. Bully pulpit preachers who remind us regularly that we're slouching ever further toward cultural depravity and godless hedonism could not be more wrong. New time religion far outstrips our forebears' religiosity. Uh, anyway, so that, that's, that's, that's what I'm writing there. So <laughs> whatever you're talking about, it must be like this decline of religion. You must mean from like, the last 25 years or 50 years or something like that, not in the, the long course of, of history. No, I'm talking about the era after 1960. And we can also talk about Europe in the same context. I'm aware of arguments uh, like the one you're citing, saying that really things aren't so bad out there from the point of view of Christians. Um, I don't agree with those arguments because if you look across the pond, you look, say, to uh, Catholic Venice, Venice, Italy. In Venice, uh, something like 15% of all Catholics attend Mass on Sunday. 
Why is that a big deal? Well, because unlike in the Protestant churches, it's not an optional thing. It is regarded as a grave sin uh, to miss Mass on Sunday uh, for any but the gravest of reasons. We see the same kind of attendance um, in the churches across Western Europe. In fact, one of the things that gave me the idea for this uh, book, How the West Really Lost God, was going to Mass in Belgium, I think, and realizing that there were no children in the church and that every one of the altar servers had gray hair. <laughs> the graying right. of the church and the decline of the church are unmistakable in the case of Europe, Western Europe. Yeah. My wife's from Cologne, Germany. You know, they have that magnificent dome there. And uh, we love going yes. there uh, every time we go to visit. Uh, it's a, even though I'm an atheist, it's a pretty spiritually moving experience, I have to say. I really get the idea of, you know, people that are living in, uh, in squalor coming from, uh, you know, tens or hundreds of miles away to, to go to this place and being totally moved by it. You know, I, I, I'm as moved there as I am going inside of a, an astronomical observatory at the top of a mountain. It's the same kind of thing, you know, touching the heavens sort of thing. Um, but in Europe, um, you know, so, so here's a question. Why are European countries so less religious than America? Of the 20, say, top 20 industrialized Western democracies, America is by far the most religious. So one explanation, uh, it, it, the two explanations I've heard is one is that in Europe, uh, most of the governments are, are fairly socialized and they have universal health care and maternity leave and they, they take care of the poor and the needy and, and so on, which is what religions traditionally have done, sort of private charity. And, and there the governments have kind of taken over that job so there's less for uh, religious uh, religions to do. Then the second hypothesis, you'll be familiar with these, of course, is that that, that in America, the separation of church and state um, means that religions have to compete. So in a marketplace of, of competing for customers, you know, they've ratcheted up the value of religion. It's, you know, it's, a, it's a fun thing to do. You go to these um, mega churches, which I'm sure you've been to, and it's, a, it's a quite a, a happening. I mean, it's fun to go to. The music and, and all the families and friends and the, and the games and babysitting and free parking. <laughs> you know, it's uh, <laughs> it, it, and, and so they, they kind of provide everything that people need. Um, you know, and this actually, this this idea goes back to Adam Smith is sort of thinking about religion economically speaking. So you know, these are two competing hypotheses uh, that I wrote about what twenty years ago now. So I'm not sure how they've they've held up over the the last twenty years by social scientists who study this thing. But so how do you think about those ideas? Oh, I think there's room for a number of theories here, and I think those are both good theories. Another one I would suggest, uh, because I thought it was charming, was um, the historian Hugh Thomas once was saying that, uh, why is it that Europe is so much less religious than America? His answer was that to get to America before modern travel, uh, one had to undertake a perilous journey. And if you made it across the ocean, you were grateful um, and that this had something to do with the American idea of providence. I think there may be uh, something in that as well. But another answer to why is Europe less religious is that they were ahead of us in the sexual revolution. They, were, uh, they pioneered the single parent home. What is the most secular area in Europe today? The answer is Scandinavia. And Scandinavia was first with the single parent home, uh, first uh, to embrace the sexual revolution at full throttle. It is also the most atomized part of Europe. In uh, Sweden, something like 50% of all households are households of one person. This, again, gets to the idea that there is something profoundly connected about the decline of Christianity in the Western world and the decline of the family. You cannot practice religion in a closet. It is intrinsically communal. And if you live in a world where people are separated uh, from one another as radically as they are today, in which they have so few people in their own lives, then you probably live in a world in which religious practice is also in decline. Well, so I guess the probably the well, let me just let me back up, Ed, parenthetically that 
you know, my my wife was raised in a in in Catholicism. She went to an all girls Catholic school, which in Cologne, in any case, this particular one was about the equivalent of a bachelor's degree in college here in America. It's just stunning uh, the quality of the education there. But you know, and just to remind people in in Germany anyway, and in some other countries, they don't have separation of church and state, and that you get uh, your taxes withheld uh, when you start work for whatever religion you were baptized in. She, in this case, Catholicism for her, so. She had her taxes withheld all the way up until, I don't know, maybe six, seven years ago when she finally went down to the, the courthouse and opted out. You have to opt out of this program. Why Scientology wanted to get in Germany back in the 90s, because it's like, oh boy, there's free money. <laughs> so we have to remember that mm. uh, th- this American idea, like the government is not going to endorse any religion. That is really unusual and really new. Historically, European countries often have state religions and, and, or, and or support them with taxes. But the other thing that's happened in Germany is all the scandals for Catholicism, anyway. You know the the priestly pedophile mm-hmm. problems, and and there was other corruptions, uh, at least in the Cologne diocese there, uh, that that I think legitimately turned people away. Why would I want to go to a place like this with these kind of people that doing these immoral things? Uh, so I think that's also been a contributing factor, although I've not seen any studies on that. And um, and by the way, I think we should remind listeners, we're talking about on average, when we're going to get into the effects of, say, the breakdown of the, of the family or the decline of religion on social uh, indices of health or personal indices of health. We're talking about on average. My wife, for example, was raised by a single mom. The, 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 the biological father just left and he didn't want anything to do with it. And it, and it worked out just fine. And, uh, and my parents were divorced when I was four and I had two super loving step uh, step parents and I had step siblings and then my dad had two girls uh, and so those my half sisters and you know it all worked out pretty well um but uh, uh, even so though I'll give you a point here is that e- even with all that I still kind of wish I had just had my mom and dad in one home because they you know the, the splitting of the home and having to go to my dad's every weekend you know Friday afternoon till Sunday night and then every other weekend as I got older there were a lot of negative aspects to that, so I, I can see your point about you know the breakdown of the nuclear family there, and and, and yet it, it it depends so much on the individual uh, circumstances of which somebody goes through, and since you mentioned, I didn't know you, you were raised in a in a you apparently with a step stepdad and all that stuff. What was that experience like for you in, in context of what you're theorizing about here? Yeah, I mean, I, I think people have very different experiences, as you say, Michael. And the point of bringing in the decline of the family is not to uh, single out anybody or stigmatize anybody. I mean, we are all living in this world after the sexual revolution. We're all affected by it in different ways. I was very fortunate. My parents were divorced as yours were uh, when young. Um, I had a wonderful stepfather and uh, lots of people in my life. But see, this is part of my point. It's not only about divorce. It's not only about single moms who do heroic work. I mean, I know I remember when my mother was one. It's not only about that. We have, this isn't Ozzie and Harriet time. We've also undermined the extended family, and it's the extended family uh, that's terribly important in this. I have a lot of sympathy for people who argue that it's wrong to speak of the nuclear family because that's putting too much pressure on two people and children. There's truth in that. Um, We are meant to live more communally than we do. And this is something that I try hard to get at in my work, because I think that the dominant celebratory story that's told about the sexual revolution as a great liberation for humanity is wrong. And I think that there have been Uh, serious downsides that we are only beginning to see. So let's leave the divorced parents, uh, et cetera, out of it. What about the fact that the fastest growing area in sociology right now is something called loneliness studies, loneliness studies. In every country of the Western world, if you can Google this or Google loneliness Japan, you will find out that Thousands of people uh, die each month all by themselves, and the entire <clears throat> excuse me entire industries have grown up around this phenomenon. People who come and clean out the apartments of people who have no living relatives, for example, or special insurance packages 
for landlords in case a lonely death happens on their watch. Things like this. Where Japan is, we will be at the rate things are going. This, again, is not something anybody foresaw uh, when the Western world embraced the sexual revolution. But this is a direct outcome of our atomized living, of our attempt to uh, re to find what the family supplies in some other realm. So far, every other realm is a poor substitute. And I, I would love to get into politics this way because uh, the other book you kindly mentioned, Primal Screams, is all about this, the connection between identity politics and the decline of the Western family. Identity politics is an attempt to substitute for primordial loyalties uh, and primordial attachments uh, to make politics into a kind of family. And I think we saw this very clearly during the summer of 2020 when there were uh, protests across the United States. There were over 10,000 um, incidents of protest, 500 of which turned violent. And it's typical for conservatives to look at something like that and dismiss it as the outpouring of, you know, so many snowflake college kids running around in the streets, <laughs> taking baseball bats to Starbucks and things like that. <laughs> but yeah. I saw something very different on the face of those protesters. I saw real suffering. I think young people especially are suffering because of the compounded weight of these trends that we're talking about. And they are desperate for attachment to a political group, to uh, an ethnic group, to a sexual identity kind of group. And that's what we are seeing, uh, especially in Gen Z uh, and the millennials. And again, this is, these are unintended consequences. Nobody looked at America in 1963 and said, well, the result of this experiment in the, called living the sexual revolution is going to be that by their 20s, uh, in 2021, um, people are going to have massive mental problems, right? Gen Z has uh, skyrocketing rates of anxiety and OCD and other problems that, you know, didn't, didn't look like this before. And I attribute this, again, to atomization to the fact that there's been a disruption in really primal social learning among uh, Western people, and we can talk more about that. But the reduction of numbers, the reduction in the number of people who have your back, who can be expected to love you no matter what, and who are there for you no matter what, uh, this, I think, is playing out in ways that no one could have anticipated. And it's part of what I'm trying to pin down in my work, because I think it's important, and I think this suffering needs to come to light. So the the current hypothesis about the Gen Z or iGen generation uh, having higher rates of uh, suicidal ideation, cutting, anxiety, depression, about triple for girls and double for boys, this is all documented in uh, Jonathan Haidt and Greg Lukianoff's book, The Coddling of the American Mind. They put it, they pin it down to too much social media, screen time, and also the coddling, the kind of helicopter parenting, the overprotectiveness of parents. Um, maybe what you're saying is that there's a deeper underlying ultimate factor behind that. That is to say, why are kids spending so much time on their screens on Facebook, say? And, and that's because they don't have the extended families that we evolved to, uh, to, to be a part of. Uh, something like that. Is that what you mean? Yes. Yes. I have a different reading of this than they do. I, I don't agree that it's coddling. I think the helicopter parent phenomenon came into being precisely because of the trends that I'm describing. In other words, people got really worried about their kids because as parents, they sensed uh, on some unconscious level, that the kids really are less safe than they used to be. Part of that is social media, which I agree is disastrous for kids. Um, but part of it is also, again, the reduction in numbers. You know, so many baby boomers get nostalgic for the days of 
well, when people just went out and played kickball or rode their bikes for five hours at a time without their parents knowing where they were. But that was taking place in a more communal setting. There was strength in numbers. And that's why parents felt like they could let their kids roam the streets. They weren't roaming the streets by themselves at age four. They were in the company of many other kids. Again, we have subtracted people um, out of other people's lives in a way that we really have to reckon with. So I appreciate um, that interpretation of the, the coddling, but I think it's coming from a different direction. Yeah, uh, and again, the idea of these kids are snowflakes and they're weak and so on, that isn't what I see in those protests, for example. They don't seem weak and snowflakey. They seem angry and engaged politically. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, well, a couple of things. Um, you know, I, and by the way, I do, I do think that hypothesis is so new that we just don't know. Gene Twenge's research on screen time and and, and Gen Z, for example, um, I think may not survive the replication uh, tests of it. We'll see. Uh, these again are are difficult social science problems. You know, I the, the more I study this, the more I see that you know there's a risk of overdetermining any particular thing you're interested, in, but there's also a big risk of undetermining it. Anytime anyone says it's this one thing. You know, it's very unlikely to be the one thing that, you know, there may be six different things and you can rank them using regression equations and analysis of variance and things like that. But there's always a certain level of uncertainty there. And then, um, you know, I, I've been, I, I read a lot of David Brooks. I know he's a, he's a fan of your work and, and speaks highly of you. Um, and he's written a, a lot on the family. And, you know, there's that, that idea of the nuclear family that a lot of conservatives talk about. It's kind of an artifact of a very short period of time in human history in the Western world that, in fact, historically, the nuclear family was more of a communal family, extended family, um, and, and, and all the way back to you know, tens of thousands of years ago or even maybe hundreds of thousands of years ago that it was normal to be raised by not just your biological parents, which is obviously a, a strong part of our human nature, but also cousins and aunts and uncles and so on. And uh, and then I had Joe Henrik on the podcast last year with his new book, The Weirdest People in the World. This is the Western, Educated, Industrialized, Rich, D Democratic. And he, now I'm not sure how his hypothesis is going to hold up either, but he pins it back to like the 15th or 14th century when the Catholic Church said, no more marrying first cousins or second cousins for that matter, all the way up to sixth cousins. And we're going to break up these communal extended families. And it's not clear why they did this, but I think that the leading idea is that it, it was a way of controlling property for the church to get more power over uh, individual property and, and have more top-down control over population. But I'm not sure about that. Anyway, that, I don't know if, if you're familiar with Joe's um, theory on that and what you, what you think about all that. No, I'm sorry. I'm not familiar with it. So don't really want to go there, but I yeah, would. Okay. How, about, um, yeah, how about the David Brooks yeah, stuff then? Uh, I would um, so, so here's a, again, a, a homely example of what I'm trying to describe. I was uh, off the air uh, right before a radio show, and the host was telling me a story about his daughter and how she had uh, come up with this fantastic idea for a new business. And I said, what's her business? He said, well, she goes, <laughs> she started out making cloth diapers, but now she delivers them to new moms and shows them how to use them. Now, the, in other words, that you could actually be a new mom and never have diapered a baby before. This, again, is the sort of learning uh, that a lot of people don't have access to anymore. And I think it's showing up in very weird ways. Uh, you know, in the book Primal Screams, I use a lot of research from animal science because I find animal science so fascinating. I think we all do. The more that animals, especially mammals, are studied, the clearer it is that they are not born knowing what they are. They have to learn by watching others of their kind. And so in one very good example of this, some cats can get down from trees and some cats you have to call the fire department to get the cat out of the tree. What's the difference between the cats who can climb down and the cats who can't? Well, it appears to be that the cats who can climb down have seen other cats do this, learned this from typically their mothers. Uh, so what does it mean when we have much smaller families, 
a lot of uh, singletons, only children, um, a lot of people who don't have a brother or don't have a sister or don't have a dad at home, etc. I think one thing it means is that there are many fewer people to learn from than our ancestors had, whether we're talking about something like uh, learning how to shoot a BB gun or learning uh, what is in the Bible. Um, we just have fewer people in our lives. We have fewer teachers all around. And again, I think this is something that's really the signature of our age. Um, and I think it explains a lot about the, the mental health issues that we're seeing uh, and probably other kinds of more subterranean suffering out there. Do you see I don't identity? Mean to make it sound like the like Gen Z is hopeless or anything like that. <laughs> no, it's quite I, the opposite. I'm yeah. I'm zeroing in on this because I think we you know we can't ameliorate that kind of suffering if we put the wrong name to it. So when the students are out there in the streets protesting against abstractions like the patriarchy or heteronormativity or whatever they may have learned as a label in college, what I'm seeing there is that. They're onto something deep. They are victims by virtue of when they were born, regardless of what they were born into. But they're not victims in the way that they've been made to understand. They are victims of something else, which is a radical social change of the last several decades. Yeah, interesting. I just thinking of a comment that uh, a guest made, Paige Harden, who has a new book out on genetics and intelligence and so on. Anyway. Uh, she's very liberal, and so she was kind of complaining about American women when they are discharged from the hospital after giving birth. Uh, they're not showed, they're not taught how to take care of your baby, how to breastfeed, how to change diapers, and so on. Whereas her European female friends who get pregnant and have a baby, the 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 state or whoever is in charge of this in, in whatever country it is, they send somebody to your house to show you how to breastfeed, how to change diapers, and so on. I guess your point would be that in, in, in before the sexual revolution, there were families that were doing that. That was the point of parents to help their adult children make that transition of how to be a parent. And now we've kind of offloaded that onto the state to do that. Yes, and I am not Darwinian about it. I, I do think um, there are probably a lot of things that could be done politically to make it easier to form families, to make it easier to have uh, more children. Um, and I think that it's overdue for people to take a good look at those things. And at least on the right, I know that people are, are trying. They are not being thoroughgoing libertarians about this because it's become obvious that uh, we don't have enough support for families, especially young families. Well, what would you recommend? So, for example, at, at the moment, the government gives me a tax break for being married. Um, I had a, a, a son at age 60, and now he's now, well, now let's see, 61. He's now five, and I get a tax break for him. So the government obviously wants me to have more kids. They're giving me incentives. And I own a home, and I get a, a, a deduction for the interest on my mortgage. So they, the government apparently wants me to be a homeowner. And of course, I'm generalizing from a specific here. This is what states do, right? They they nudge people with incentives to do certain things. Uh, and, and so, what are you what are you proposing? If you've read my books, you know that I'm not in the policy end of things. Uh, but yes, of course, what I'm proposing is that we have more incentives to make it easier for families to be created in the first place, to stay together, to raise more children, et cetera. All right, let's talk about uh, identity politics a little bit and your, your hypothesis there. I was just thinking, you know, John McWhorter has just made this analogy between the anti-racism movement, BLM movement, and, uh, and religion, that it's a kind of faux religion, uh, where we're all born into original sin, we're all racists uh, to the core. And the only way to get around that is to absolve yourself and, you know, confess your sins and so on. And that, uh, you know, there are punishments for people that do not confess their sins and, you know, and on and on. He goes on and on about this. It's an interesting analogy. Um, you know, X is like a religion. You, you, you get that a lot. Sometimes maybe it's overused, but I, but I see his point. I think that's your point about identity politics, right? It's, they're, they're attempting to replace the family or something like that or religion. 
Yes. Yeah. I'm, I'm entirely on board with that idea. I wrote an essay called uh, The Zealous Faith of Secularism uh, a few years ago, which gets at the same point. You know, America is a Protestant country or was. And so I think it's not so much a Catholic theological sensibility that we're seeing out there as a, a grim and determined Protestantism that has now morphed out of the Protestant churches and into these new political forms. And in that religion also, I think uh, there's the equivalent of, of sacraments as well as the, the punishments and the original sin, et cetera. Um, abortion, I think, plays that role of uh, on the progressive left. It is the sacrament through which many people enter that uh, new church in the first place. And I think also there's the equivalent of, of saints, you know, of secular saints in that new religion. There are people like Margaret Sanger, for example, uh, who are untouchable, who are off limits for any kind of revisionist thought, whatever she may have said about black people. And the reason that she's untouchable is that she's a secular saint in that uh, new religion. Uh, that I would argue has been built out of the sexual revolution. Um, and the same with uh, Margaret Mead and, and Kinsey and other pioneers whose work uh, has come under serious question, but who remain uh, politically untouchable. Uh, so yeah, I'm very on board with the idea that we don't ever really get rid of religion. It's just going to take different forms once we think we've pushed it out the door. And the forms it's taking in our time are very interesting and in some cases worrisome. So do you think of religion as something like a, a part of our human nature, an impulse to want to belong to some kind of group with a purpose that gives your life meaning? And that if traditional religions fall out into disuse in that role, something else will replace it. In this case, it could be Marxism yes, absolutely. Or, or whatever, it, you know, Ayn Randism, <laughs> something like that. No, I think, you know, the phrase village atheist exists for a reason. It's a singular word, the village atheist, not a village of atheists. Because I think in any given time, people will feel that need to do exactly what you described, find meaning, and I would argue, find a a transcendental horizon of some kind uh, that they can affix themselves to. You can argue about whether there's a there there, whether there is such a thing beyond that horizon, um, and that that's what they're feeling, uh, that they're feeling the gravitational pull of something real, like a god. But that we have this impulse, I think, is uh, irrefutable, which is not to say everyone, Michael. But it is to say, my prediction would be, you know, Christianity could go away tomorrow and something will take its place. Something already is. Um, we're seeing that in politics. I think that's right. Um, you know, the rise of the nuns, that is people with no religious affiliation, has skyrocketed. It was, uh, you know, maybe 5% in the 90s and maybe 7% in the 2000s. And now it's about 25% of all Americans and about 33% of millennials, it's, and we don't have a good figure for Gen Z, but it's probably close to half, have no religious affiliation. Now, that doesn't make them atheists, as I point out to my atheist friends, you know, because they're not necessarily gravitating toward, you know, being members of the Skeptic Society or the American Humanist Association, which has gone far <laughs> left, woke, progressive, unfortunately. But, um, but in fact, they're, they're turning to other alternative religions, like maybe kind of a Western Buddhism or you know, meditation uh, type groups or like Deepak Chopra's uh, movement, uh, you know, which is fairly benign and I, I think uh, is, is filling a need that people have. But I think that's your point. They're, they're not going to nothing. They're going to something else that fills mm -hmm. the void. Yeah, very much so. And we see this again in identity politics over and over again. Just look at the ferocity with which people defend their chosen group. You know, it's the kind of ferocity that people would have brought to defending the family. It's uh, very reminiscent of the Godfather in some ways. 
Um, and it, again, it's that search for attachment. These protests from 2020 don't look like footage of the civil rights protests. They don't even look like footage of the Vietnam War protests. There is a an irrationalism and a, a naked fury about them that I think is distinct. And that's what young people are carrying around. And this is not in any way to minimize the role of police brutality in unleashing those protests, et cetera. But they quickly became about things that did not concern police brutality. In Washington, D.C., where I am right now, there were protests where people shined flashlights around in neighborhoods of Georgetown, for example, late at night, waking families up uh, or disrupting people who were dining outside restaurants at a time when they couldn't dine anywhere else if they were dining out. And again, this was not about police brutality. This was about, uh, I think, a kind of fury uh, and an envy for people who were still living in this ordered world of eating dinner out with your family or sleeping at night in your home uh, with your family. I saw a familial uh, hunger and, again, anger um, in those kinds of, of those sorts of political uh, acts of political theater that we were seeing. I don't know whether you agree with that, but there was something going on there. Yeah, about more yeah, than yeah, no, of, of course. I'm kind of split on this. Sometimes I think a lot of these kids just they're bored and it's like, oh, boy, let's go down there and march. What are we marching about? <laughs> I don't know, but this will be fun. And, and and on the flip side, I would say probably half or more of the people that were at the Capitol on January 6th, they weren't there to overthrow the government. They were just there like, this is a fun thing to do. This is my 1776 moment. I'm going in and I'm taking selfies. <laughs> and it's like, what are these people thinking? I think a lot of them aren't thinking at all. They're just like, whatever, let's just go have, let's go stir up some shit and cause some problems. That'll be fun. Uh, but there are ideologues. And so what are they thinking? And um you know, there I think uh, it, there's this kind of pushback against all tradition. And here maybe there is a tie into the 60s. You know, this kind of, you know, don't trust anyone over 30 and overthrow, you know, overthrow the man, you know, that the authorities of any kind. So the nuclear family, kind of a hierarchical so, social structure, a, a society based on the rule of law uh, with society, societal traditions and institutions that we trust, kind of a Burkean conservatism, it's all got to go. So you start with George Floyd, and then you extrapolate from there to, you know, the police and then all government and laws and so on. And, and you end up, you know, flashlights in people's faces because they're dining. Uh, I, I think there's kind of a, a logic in their heads anyway to something like that. What they have in mind to replace it with, I have no idea because they, they never articulated that. I'm so glad you brought up January 6th because uh, in Primal Screams and elsewhere, I argue that identity politics isn't just something that the left made up. We can find it across the political spectrum. And on the right, it shares these features of irrationalism, grievance, deprivation. Um, one of the reasons that I think the argument of Primal Screams is correct is exactly that we are seeing this uh, across the political spectrum this desperate desire to belong. Uh, I wrote an essay for Claremont Review about the QAnon phenomenon a couple of <laughs> issues ago, yeah. which yeah. I think is very much like the transgender phenomenon. Uh, there, there are numerous features that the two things share in common. Uh, uh, birth on the internet, uh, extensive time spent on the internet following the movement, but above all, the way in which both these movements uh, became all-encompassing substitutes for other kinds of attachments. In both the case of QAnon and in the case of the transgender movement, there are stories by family members about what it's like to try and extract people from these internet uh, groups that they've become so passionately attached to. Again, and not assigning moral equivalence anywhere, but stepping back from this, I think we see very clearly that same 
desire to attach and to belong to a community that has your back. And it's just as vivid in the case of QAnon followers as it is in the case of identity politics uh, practitioners on the left. Yeah, I think um, you know. It's, I'm I'm glad to see you you go after the right because they're they're just as problematic in my mind as people on the far left. I I, I often think we really need a to, for a functioning civil democracy, civil society, and a and a constitutional republic, we need two fairly close to center parties, just a little to the left and a little to the right, to balance each other out. As Madison said, ambition must be made to counter ambition. And the further out to the left and right you go, the crazier things can get. So, of course, I worry about the far left progressive woke anti-racism movement. This is all counter to everything we know about uh, how civil rights and uh, evolve and how the, the world becomes more moral. But on the right, you know, this kind of authoritarian populism that's taken root in the last uh, five to ten years, I guess, um, you know, is is worrying. And I think again, they're replacing. The kind of boring democracy of of all the checks and balances and all the things that you have to go through to make changes. This was the whole point that Burke made in his book on the French Revolution: is you know that Americans did it right and the French did it wrong. That you know, and and here's why: that you know these social institutions that have evolved over centuries, you know, those are hard won victories of how to make social change without causing too much destruction and keep the body bags uh, at a low number. And, uh, and and so both the far left and the far right, I think, are are, are violating that. You know, they, they want to overthrow these these institutions that have been hard won for so long. And I'm guessing you would say religion is one of those, uh, but but it's not the only one. Well, here's what I, I, I think. I'd love your reaction to this, Michael. Um, I think our problem is beyond politics. The problem as I see it at its widest, is that we're living at a time when irrationalism, for various reasons, has become unbound. And I would argue that the failure of the family to um, socially educate its young is part of that problem. Uh, But the divide out there isn't even left or right anymore. It's between people who believe that there is such a thing as truth that we can ascertain with our reason and with the use of various um, empirical instruments, and people who think there's no truth at all. And that's why we can have this conversation, and we are on the same page about a a lot of important stuff, because we actually believe in that, that truth is discoverable somehow. Uh, The problem we have is that a lot of the authorities in charge of important institutions like the university are living in a postmodern world where they don't believe in truth. So you have this paradox that the people who are supposed to be disseminating and uh, discerning and disseminating truth don't believe in it anymore. Um, That's a problem beyond the crazies on the left or the crazies on the right. And I'm not sure what we do about it. Do we think the market will take care of this somehow? Do we think that parents will stop paying Uh, hefty tuition uh, to have their kids go off and be told that there is no truth and that nothing matters. What do you think? Yeah, I agree. It's a big problem. We did a whole issue. Hang on. Let me get this issue here. One second. Here we go. (laughs) So we did a a whole issue of Skeptic Magazine on are we living in a post-truth world? Actually, we didn't phrase it as a question because uh, of that of that law, I forget whose law it is. That any any headline that ends in a question mark can be answered no. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> and so we had Steve Pinker. Uh, we titled it "Why We Are Not Living in a Post Truth Era." Okay, so there's there's two things. I uh, yes, you're correct. People argue that we are living in a post truth world, but to make their case, they have to make a case. They have to make arguments. They have to use reason to make this case that reason is not used anymore. So they. In a way, it's kind of self-refuting the moment they open their mouths. Uh, and, and, you know, in order to speak, you have to be free to speak. So obviously you are free to speak. So I think what they're talking about, uh, I think the problem is that um, it, there's this kind of push for my personal experience, my personal truth should be taken seriously. And so my next big book is on conspiracy theories. I've been thinking about this a lot, you know, like QAnon, since you wrote about that. 
you know, do, do people really believe QAnon? I mean, they say they do. There's some, you know, two digit percentage of people uh, that tick the box to survey uh, takers. Yes, I think there's something to the QAnon conspiracy that uh, there's a satanic secret pedophile ring being run by Democrats out of a pizzeria in Washington, D.C. Now, people can't possibly believe this, really. Well, one guy did, Edgar Welch. He went there with a gun to break up the uh, the pedophile ring, you know, and that that's what you do if there's a crime being committed and the police won't do anything about it. You're like, I'm going to take the law into my own hands. But in fact, what most people do is they just say, well, I think that's possible in a kind of a tribal way. Yeah, I don't like those Democrats. I don't like Hillary. And so if I show you that there's no, if I take you to the Comet Ping Pong Pizzeria and show you there's no basement, much less a satanic cult, you're not going to change your mind and go, in that case, I'll vote for Hillary. You were never going to vote for Hillary, right? It's kind of a proxy uh, truth for, that stands in for something else. I, I, I signal to my social group, you know, I'm so loyal to what the, my, my tribe that I'm even willing to publicly endorse this completely crazy idea, you and I, something like that. So I think a lot of our social, a lot of our beliefs or claim beliefs, like people who doubt climate change is real and those who accept it, studies show that neither one of them knows much about it at all. What they're doing is signaling to their tribes, I trust science or I don't trust science, or I trust authorities or I don't trust authorities. Uh, and it, even though no one knows much about it at all. And so I think you know the research on this from cognitive psychology shows that much of our reason evolved for you know, kind of convincing other people that we're right because our group is right, rather than veridical perception of this is the way the world actually is. Uh, and so part of us in the rationality community that push, try to teach <clears throat> critical thinking and science and reason and rationality is that we, we got to work at it. So to answer your question, what to do about it? Well, <laughs> you know, those of us in the reality community, you know, we have to keep pushing that there are standards of knowledge there. You know, we can achieve reliable uh, knowledge and there are, and here are the tools, rationality, reason, empiricism, and, and, and disputation for that. You need to have free speech. You can't punish people for dissenting from your view because that's the opposite of what we want to do to, to, to arrive at the truth. Anyway, so that's my kind of brief thoughts on that. But don't you think this fierce desire to be part of these collectives signals what I'm talking about, which is that the Western world uh, is in the grips of an identity crisis. I really do believe that. I think that's what we see when we see these, these silos and we see the ways in which people let their political tribe make all their decisions for them. I think this is a crisis of identity that is brought on again uh, by the collapse of family and religion. If you were to ask the question, who am I? Um, of modern people. I don't think they would respond the way people would have responded throughout most of human history. Throughout most of human history, I think that the instinctive answer to that is, well, I am a son of so-and-so, I am a daughter of so-and-so, I'm a sister, I'm a mother, I'm a wife. You would explain who you are by your familial attachments or perhaps clan attachments or tribal attachments. Or if you're a Christian or you know, a member of another faith, you would say, well, I'm a child of God. This is what the Catholic Catechism teaches. I'm a child of God. That's my primary identity, not my brown hair and not uh, my longings uh, and not my, you know, personal experience. So young people today especially are deprived, not on purpose, but deprived of ways of answering that elemental question, who am I? with resort to these traditional means. And so they are, I think, frantic to find some other way to answer the question, which again is where identity politics comes in. You know, among conservatives especially, I don't know if this is true among liberals, but there's a lot of head scratching now about transgenderism as the one thing that nobody could have seen coming. You know, like, where did this come from? Why is it such a phenomenon? Why is it being forced all over? But I see this very differently, uh, given the kinds of uh, primal confusions that I'm trying to describe. It would be a wonder if transgenderism weren't a thing, because it is but a subset of a much wider ranging crisis of identity, especially among the young. 
Maybe. I think there might be something to that. Let me just kind of think out loud about this. Um, I've already got myself in trouble on this podcast talking about transgenderism. I had Abigail Dreyer on the podcast, and I, I do think she has a, a pretty good point. And I think there's evidence for this that it's more of a social contagion phenomenon. The spike, I mean, the spike in, in numbers of people self-identifying as trans mm -hmm. in their teens, especially girls. Uh, I think there's evidence for that. I think the percentage of people that are actually transgender uh, or they have uh, uh, gender dysphoria as young children is very, very small, like 0.001% maybe. Uh, and they've always been there. And so, um, you know, you have a conflation of two different things. One, you have the rise of identity politics, where then it becomes rewarding to identify as that group, as trans. So the, the point, for example, the point Abigail makes, one of, one of her points, is that these teenage girls don't want to be boys. They want to be trans, because trans is the cool thing. And I remember Andrew Sullivan wrote an essay, what happened, all, I think it was him, what happened to all the lesbians? It's no longer cool to be lesbian. Uh, I mean, it wasn't acceptable for most of human history, then it was acceptable for maybe 15 years or so, and then now it's out, because that's not the cool thing to do. So you have that kind of uh, that kind of social contagion element, although trans people listening to this will say, I've, I've lost my mind. No, this is not how they feel at all. But, you know, that's that's hard to get inside somebody's head or heart what they're actually thinking. But again, that's that's sort of how I think about it. And then, and then you graft onto that the kind of general expansion of rights to more and more people, which is a good thing. Uh, I mean, even if only one person on the planet were trans, they sh if you're an American, then you should be protected by the Constitution like any other American should be. And you should have the same rights and privileges as everybody else. Uh, I mean, that's a given, but but it's not a given <laughs> because of our history. So I think uh, to, to take the trans position, it's like, uh, you know, we're the latest group to be discriminated against because we're not experiencing the same rights and privileges as everybody else. The, you know, the, the you know gays and lesbians got that finally, but now let's expand it to the rest of the LGBT community, and therefore it, it erupts in social media in, in a way because we've already made so much progress in rights that now this is like one of the one of the final categories. Anyway, I'm just kind of riffing there mm -hmm. in that. Yeah, well, I have uh, something that I hope is a friendly amendment. Um, and I mean, including to people in the transgender community who might know the truth of this better than anyone. When you see, as you as you remarked, and as Abigail Schreier says, that most of the uh, push for transgenderism, most of the numbers of people wanting to change are coming from young women who don't want to be women. Why would that be? I think the reasons are pretty obvious. I mean, they are living in a threat-intensive environment in many cases. What do I mean by that? Well, Let's start with the threats before they're born. Uh, there is gendercide in America. Uh, baby unborn girls are far more likely to uh, be killed than boys. This is also true across the world. By the abortion, way. you mean? You're uh, talking about abortion. So there's that abortion. Yeah, at a very subliminal level, that's got to register <laughs> somewhere. Um, mm. And after that, what happens? Well, wait, no, I, wait hang I on for a second. So I, I know it, this is true in China. Yeah. This is true in America too. Yes. Yeah, there's, an, there's a gender imbalance in abortion. Um, hmm. And it's, it's truest in uh, the sort of most traditional societies where you would expect to find it. But yeah, it's generally true. It's something that uh, I can send you some stuff about. But, but then let's go on. Uh, what happens to young girls? Well, I think they face a, a terrifying environment, especially as of the smartphone, because pornography is everywhere. And, you know, boys who have never held a girl's hand have been transformed by it, their expectations, their, their thoughts, how they act with girls. Uh, so all of that, I think, is pretty scary, too. And then getting back to an original you know, point made earlier, of course, many have no brothers, male cousins, fathers. Uh, and, you know, you could say it's sexist. But brothers and fathers and male cousins and uncles and people like that have traditionally performed a, a protective role. Um, a lot of girls are being thrust into the world without any of that. We saw this in the Me Too movement. 
of I at one point sat down and read through hundreds of accounts from you know people and women in the Me Too movement, and it was striking how seldom, almost never, uh, a protective male influence was mentioned. In the case of a couple of uh, celebrities, boyfriends were mentioned as having played a protective role against predatory men in the industry, but only a couple of times. And so for the most part, it just seemed like these young women, no matter how educated, um, and no matter what kind of products of elite universities they may be, were just being like pushed out into the world uh, on their own, uh, with a, well, like in many cases, a lack of social learning. Um, and I think all of that plays a part in transgenderism. Why do girls not want to be girls? Because they are more threatened in novel ways than they, than they were before. Interesting. That's that would be a, theory. Mine. that would be a good, a good sociological experimenter. I'm not sure how you'd collect data on that, but, uh, but with both the trans movement and the Me Too movement, they're both so new. I don't know if there's any d good data sets on that. Uh, just, I just thought of one example of this that you, I think you'll like, um, I did a study of all the final statements made by Texas death row inmates just before they're executed. It's all, it's a database, believe it or not, in the Texas Department of Justice. And you can go there and download it, and there's every single statement that anyone ever made. And so I did a content analysis my, with my two graduate students, and, and then we hired a few other people to code them as well, and then did an iterator reliability between our codings of these final statements and what the kind of the emotional theme was or what the, what the different you know, uh, subjects were that they wanted to talk about. Uh, so just imagine that the guy's on the gurney with the arms out, the needles are in the arm, the microphone comes down, do you have anything you'd like to say? And uh, it was like 800 and something uh, uh, statements. And, and uh, only w I only found one who said, uh, I, I just want to say I'm sorry to my dad or I love my dad. Uh, but there were hundreds that said something about their mom. You know, I, I just, I love my mom. I'm, I, you know, I love my sister. I love, you know, my, but none of them seem to have uh, referenced their fa father except one. And I, and I remember thinking, I, I wonder if there's something to that. I mean, these are guys that are, you know, serial killers or, or mass murder, not, not mass murders, but, you know, serious crimes, right? So, uh, <coughs> and, and murder, rape, and so on. And, and so I thought maybe they just didn't have fathers. I mean, a lot of them in Texas are black and Hispanic. And, and so, you know, and we all know that the, the rate of, percentage of fatherless homes in the black community um, is what now, 75%, something like that, up from 25% with the famous Moynihan report in the 19, early 1960s. Uh, so that would support your, the if it's true, I'm, I'm not 100% sure of that, but it was an observation I made. Oh, there are strong, <clears throat> excuse me, there are strong correlations between fatherlessness and crime which I think James Q. Wilson did the definitive study on that. Um, something like 95% of men in maximum security prisons uh, grew up without a biological father in the house. Uh, it was some striking statistic like that. That's no surprise. And of course, it also doesn't mean that everybody without a dad at home is going to uh, turn course, out on that average. Way. Right. But, <clears throat> you know, I think the idea that it's toxic to talk about these things does a great disservice, including to uh, the people in the prisons. <laughs> um, we have to be able to talk about the root causes of things uh, in order to ameliorate them. And the fact that white America is playing catch-up ball big time um, is something else that we need to pay attention to. Uh, the rate, uh, the number of kids living in fatherless homes uh, who are white now passes the number that Moynihan was worried about, for example. Uh, sorry, the percentage. So we need to be able to air these things, um, regardless of the political consequences, I think. Yeah. Uh, let me just give you a couple of counterexamples here. One of the reviews of your uh, book at the Catholic National Catholic Reporter, Michael Sean Winters, uh, says that Eberstadt correctly notes the plight of the black family in America and the controversy surrounding the Moynihan report back in 1965 and how the situation has only gotten worse since then. She is correct, indeed, that this is a huge societal problem. But black Americans also continue to register the highest rates of religiosity in the country. 
So he's using this as a counterfactual uh, to your thesis. Um, I don't see how that refutes the idea that we need to pay attention to fatherlessness, whether it's in uh, the black community or the white community or any other community. It's obviously uh, having negative consequences for millions of kids. So yeah, but I, I think his see... point was that it's, it's not related to religion. It's There's some other causes. Because the, 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 the black well, community is very religious, but... Yes, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't know how he's defining religion there. I mean, I, I don't think that was a, a piece with footnotes. I actually don't think I read it. So, um, yeah. Well, just just to bring up other counterexamples that I thought of reading, reading your book. So here I, 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 in my book, The Moral Arc, I, I discussed the study by um, Paul, Gregory Paul, in which he takes the like top 20 industrialized Western democracies and ranks them by religiosity. So, and that measure is like church attendance and do you have a Bible in the home and, and forth. Uh, and then he uses different measures of societal health, homicide rates, suicide rates, teen pregnancy rates, abortion rates, STD rates, um, and, and, uh, infant mortality rates, and, and so on. There's maybe a dozen of these. And that, the correlation is pretty striking. The more religious the country, the worse off this is, the, these conditions are. And America's by far and away the worst. I mean, we have the highest suicide rates, homicide rates, teen pregnancy rates, STD rates, and so on, gun violent rates, uh, infant mortality rates, and so on. Now, part of my response to that is, yep, each of those has a different causal vector leading to these outcomes that has nothing to do with religion. But... If religion is such a great prophylactic for society, if you're going to make the arg argument that societies need religion as a kind of a social glue or to reinforce moral values and institutions of, of stability and so on, it doesn't seem to be working in America. We're the most religious of all these, and we have the worst outcomes on these measures. We are secularizing rapidly. I have not read what you're talking about. So again, I would hesitate to comment on it specifically, but the idea that we're becoming a kinder and gentler place as we become less Christian is unsustainable, I think. Let me give you just a couple of examples. Um, one is the research of uh, Arthur Brooks, which you probably are acquainted with. I know him, yeah. <clears throat> you know, showing that religious believers, and this goes across denominations, uh, are more charitable in the sense of writing checks to charitable causes. Uh, they donate more time. They are, are, are more likely to volunteer than non-religious people. They even donate more blood than non-religious people, etc. <clears throat> and my point here is not religious triumphalism. <laughs> it's not a very good time for triumphalists that way. Uh, my point is instead that you can see that Christianity has done some good things for this country, and that's not a hard proposition to defend. And when for example, uh, feminists and others go after Christian charities that do things like provide emergency uh, lodging and other services to pregnant women. You know, there are efforts to shut down these charities because they are Christian. Uh, nobody asked, what about the pregnant women who might need these things? What I'm trying to get at here is that uh, there is a, a cold-bloodedness about the attacks on Catholic and other Christian charities, adoption agencies, refugee settlement agencies. And I really don't understand why it's okay with people on the left um, th that real life people who need these things are being ignored in the push to shut them down. I, I don't I don't think that's okay. I think it's a good thing that Christians band together and do things like soup kitchens and adoption agencies. Um, and I think even if you didn't believe anything, you could see that that's a good thing. But instead, what we see is what I would characterize as a ruthless effort in the name of abstract ideology to put some Christian charities out of business. Um, and that's not okay. It's not okay from the perspective of the people who need those charities. 
Certainly, I, I would agree with that. Is that true? I mean, is there data showing a, a striking trend that Christian charities are being attacked or shut down and it's by people on the left or are these anecdotes that we're just noticing? Oh, sure, sure. Yeah, I can send you some. I can send you something on that, too. Um, because, for example, emergency pregnancy centers uh, have basically been put out of business in the state of California. These are places where women could get free sonograms and uh, diapers and, you know, have basic needs met. And it's not the only example. Adoption agencies, same thing, uh, in the name of uh, sexual revolution ideology. Uh, Catholic adoption agencies have been sued and put out of business. And that's another thing. Why all the suits against religious organizations? I mean, every dollar that they have to spend defending themselves or the dollar that they're taking away from the mission that they're trying to perform. Uh, so yeah, I, I think that's a big unanswered question mark. Why <clears throat> is it okay for mostly progressives uh, to go after these charities? Yeah, and then I guess they if may counter that- we plural society as we do, it yeah. shouldn't be okay. <laughs> why, why then does the right go after Planned Parenthood when they're trying to do the same thing? They want to help women, poor women. Well, that's a separate argument. Does abortion help women? Um, or does do the unborn have constitutional rights? Uh, I'm not sure we can settle that one here. Well, let me, um, let me give it a shot. Let me give it a shot. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. To me, I, I think this is one of these difficult uh, questions that can never be answered ultimately in an empirical sense, not an empirical truth. It has an element to it. Science can give us some criteria by which where we draw the line, you know, now six weeks at the heartbeat or 22 weeks at the neural template uh, is, is complete and the infant can feel uh, pain or maybe 24 weeks of viability outside of the womb. But but the decision of where you're going to draw the line, that's a pol purely political issue. Uh, and that has a kind of different set of criteria of what is true, uh, which is why we have elections and we, you know, we, we vote people in and out and so on, and we try to uh, legislate things. Um, but to me, the problem is not abortion. It's unwanted pregnancies. Why are women getting pregnant when they don't want to get pregnant? And so as I think about it, it you know, it's poverty. Uh, maybe we'll add your fatherless homes or, uh, or not a, a stable family structure, uh, economic, lack of economic empowerment, um, lack of access to birth control and, uh, either cheap or free as part of healthcare programs. Um, and, 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 and so, cause we know from so, at least some studies that where women, uh, you know, have economic empowerment, they have access to birth control. Uh, eventually, it, it takes a little time, a few years, for, for pregnancy, unwanted pregnancy rates to go down, and then abortion rates go down. So shouldn't we be able to find common ground between pro-lifers and pro-choicers that our goal is to reduce the number of unwanted pregnancies, and then the number of abortions will just naturally go down? And then, then, then it becomes a technical problem. What's the best way to reduce unwanted pregnancies? I appreciate your effort here, Michael, but the idea that more contraception will prevent abortion has been uh, falsified uh, since the 1970s. I mean, the country is awash in contraception, and we still have plenty of abortion. I suspect your, again, more subterranean motives are in play. Why do so many women uh, get pregnant who say they don't want to get pregnant? I I'm not sure that their motives are 100% uh, as described. So in other words, we're human beings. Somebody once said there's nothing more natural in the world than for a teenage girl to have a baby. Girls like babies. Uh, so we are, you know, of divided heart. I have no doubt that a lot of unintended pregnancies result from people who love each other or kind of love each other and, you know, kind of without meaning to or sort of keep that door to a uh, new life open. I'm not sure that flooding the zone with more contraceptives will change that. I think that's human nature. And so what needs changing is a world in which that baby becomes an impossible outcome. Uh, 
you know, it was Mother Teresa who said, uh, it is a poverty that a child must die so that you can do as you wish. It's kind of shocking coming from a saint, but but there is truth in that. Uh, so what we need to to do instead, I think, is just some basic restoration uh, toward a world in which uh, a new life coming into being is something to be embraced. Um, you know, that changes your life in a good way. Uh, and we have, I think, because of secularization, we've inherited a, a much more crabbed uh, and depressing and small view of life in which abortion becomes a solution to something uh, in, instead of a tragedy. Uh, so that's how I see it. I'm not trying to duck the question. I, I think of this well, in a very big I, picture. Yeah, I don't think way. you're... No, I don't think you're trying to duck, duck it at all. I, and, and by the way, we should add parenthetically that it's also possible to be pro-choice and anti-abortion. Like, I personally would not want to do this. I'm not going to do that, but I, I feel it's none of my business what you know somebody else does with their body. And that in the long stretch of, of you know civil rights and giving women more power, giving them the choice uh, over their bodies uh, it, you know, in terms of reproductive choices is important. I, I would rather give that up and even while recognizing that you are killing a human life it's not you know it's not fetal tissue you know it is a human life for sure uh, whether it's a person or not legally you know that's again in that gray area where you know what what does the law say so for in california for example when um what's his name peterson killed his wife lacey peterson and she was i think eight months pregnant it's a double homicide right in california the, the eight month fetus is a person so you've killed two people, not one person, all right? So, but we can, you know, where you where you put that seven weeks or six weeks or whatever is, I guess, a legal thing. But um, but it, but here's what I wrote about this, and maybe I'm wrong about this. This is one of my uh, columns in Scientific American. Uh, so you know, w w what are you proposing? It, there's you know, the kind of abstinence or birth control. So then I, I write, abstinence would obviate abortions, just as starvation would forestall obesity. The reason that uh, there's a reason uh, no one has proposed chastity as a solution for overpopulation, sexual aestheticism doesn't work because the physical desire is nearly as fundamental as food to our survival and flourishing. A 2008 study published in the Journal of Adolescent Health entitled Abstinence Only and Comprehensive Sex Education and the Initiation of Sexual Activity in Teen Pregnancy found that among American adolescents ages 15 to 19, abstinence-only education did not reduce the likelihood of engaging in vaginal intercourse, and that adolescents who received comprehensive sex education had a lower risk of pregnancy than adolescents who received abstinence-only or no sex education. A 2011 PLOS, Public Library of Science, one paper analyzed abstinence-only education and teen pregnancy rates in 48 U.S. states concluded that Increasing emphasis on abstinence education is positively correlated with teenage pregnancy and birth rates, controlling for socioeconomic status, educational attainment, and ethnicity. And then this funny paper I found in 2013, published in the British Medical Journal, called Like a Virgin Mother, Analysis of Data from Longitudinal U.S. Population Representative Sample Survey, 45 of the 70... 870 American women studied between 1995 and 2009 said they became pregnant without sex. <laughs> Who were these immaculately <laughs> conceiving parthenogenic Marys? They were twice as likely as other pregnant women to have signed a chastity pledge, and they were significantly more likely to report that their parents had difficulties discussing sex or birth control with them. Anyway, so uh, in other words, the argument is that um, yeah, you can you can practice chastity and uh, abstinence and ch and tell tell your daughters don't do it. But in the in the heat of the moment, the passion of the moment, you're in the back seat of the car, you're wherever you are with the boy, and you're kissing, and and then things heat up, and you don't have any birth control, and then boom. Well, <laughs> now maybe it, maybe I'm abstinence <laughs> only, yeah. Maybe I've cherry picked the studies. It's Maybe a, you want to counter with other studies. No, I I mean I have no particular brief for abstinence only education. I think that's a Protestant evangelical initiative for the most part. Um and my answer to that is uh what would really make things better is earlier marriage. Like in other words, I think a lot of the 
unwanted, unintended pregnancies uh, in the world today are coming about, as I said, because someone really loves her boyfriend. And then somehow this happens. Uh, and then the guy walks. We need a society in which it's harder for the guy to walk. And a society that would encourage early marriage, I think, would be a better place too. So that's my answer to the abstinence only. Yeah. Okay, good. I mean, in, in, in general, we need a society in which there's more love, where people are loving each other more, whether it's the boyfriend uh, who wants to walk out, uh, who decides that love demands he stay instead, um, or whether it's uh, uh, trying to change hearts and minds on the abortion question, because a new life really is a, a beautiful thing. And because looking at life from the end of it, as opposed to the beginning of it, when people are old uh, and surrounded by family on their deathbed, I think, you know, that's a beautiful thing. <clears throat> Nobody in that situation says, oh, I wish I could take that one back. Um, so we need to ex expand uh, our, our hearts. And I am sure that that sounds sentimental and not sentimental. Uh, but I do think that the problems of our age Problems with the family, problems with the churches are fundamentally problems of a lack of love that, uh, if properly understood, would leave us in a much better place than we're in right now. I mean, that is one point. I don't think anybody looking at America today says, well, we're in a really good place. I think a lot of us have the feeling that there are problems out there we didn't see coming and suffering that we didn't understand. Um, and I'm trying to address those things in my work because I really do love this country and think that we could take it to a better place. Can you do that without religion? Can you have social norms that are healthier for more people in more places more of the time without the idea of there's this eye in the sky watching us or there's a promise of an afterlife or there's a cosmic courthouse where things will be settled after you know this, this world? and so on. I mean, the entire Constitution is premised on this idea that, you know, it's a secular government, that, that we're not based on religion. We're just declaring uh, these rights. Uh, all people are born equal, and they are endowed by their creator or whatever, the laws of nature, whatever it is, that, uh, you know, th this is how people should be treated, and we've been fine-tuning that ever since. That, that's kind of a secular argument, and, uh, and I think it derives mainly from Enlightenment reason that it's, you can't start off saying, well, the, the foundation of our morals are that Jesus died for our sins because you've just cut out two-thirds of the world. you gotta, you got to make a secular argument or a rational argument that there's nothing special about me and, and the place I happen to be standing just because I'm me and you're not, and therefore my values are better than yours. I have to appeal to you and your reason uh, to take me, if I want you to take me seriously. And and, and from there we build, you know, like Kant's categorical imperative and, and Hume and John Rawls and, and all the great moral philosophers that, uh, you know, Peter Singer and, you, you know, what this kind of principle of interchangeable perspectives, I have to be able to put myself in your shoes and imagine what it'd be like to be you to determine how I want you to be treated and, and, and how I want to be treated by you, something like that. Can you build a civil society on that alone? Well, a lot of people in this country are trying, and it doesn't look as if it's sufficient. I would also point out the, the idea behind the founding is itself ineradicably Christian. The idea that we are equal, with equal moral worth, uh, comes from the idea that we are equal in the eyes of God. There isn't any secular basis for just declaring that. So there is a Christian ethos that I think suffuses our laws, um, or has until recently, uh, that is part of who we are, uh, which is not to say that we are all Christians now. It's just to say that I don't think those things can be as easily disentangled as you seem to think, Michael. Well, I'm not sure I have the, the correct answer. I'd be curious to know, maybe you don't have it at your fingertips, you probably don't. Where in the Bible you get that? Where, where does it say that people are created equal? 
because it sure doesn't look like it for most of the, the biblical stories. Uh, I'll give you from the, the idea of souls. Oh, the souls. Okay, the souls yeah. have infinite worth. Hmm. Okay. There's some inference I think going on there. Uh. Yeah. D Dinesh D'Souza. I don't know if you know Dinesh. He wrote a whole book about this, and he makes this. I asked him for that passage, and I, now I can't find it. It was, uh, I think, one of Paul's passages about if you're Greek, you can remain Greek or something like that. Let me see if I can find that. Uh, it, it, no Greek, it, no Christian, or no Jew, etc. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me see if I can find that here. It's an interesting thing. While I'm looking yeah, for that. Yeah, the idea that. Go ahead. Please. The idea that by virtue of being Christian, you eradicate. Um, pre-existing distinctions, distinctions that used to divide people. So that's the universalism that I'm talking about that we also see in the Constitution. Here it is. This is what, when I asked Anish for this, he gave me. Um, let's see. In Galatians 3.28, when the Apostle Paul says, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all, ye are all one in Christ Jesus. Uh, d D'Souza imagines that this Bible verse is the foundation of the famous line in the preamble of the American Declaration of Independence, all men are created equal. D'Souza opines, here Christian individualism is combined with Christian universalism, and the two together are responsible for one of the great political miracles of our day, a global agreement on rights held to be inviolable. Well, I agree, it's a, it's a political miracle, and we were the first to do it, really, and it's now becoming universalized slowly. Anyway, but I, I then uh, write, uh, D'Souza has yanked this pa passage out of context, and the surrounding verses demonstrate clearly what Paul is up to. Like in Galatians 3, one, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you, that ye should not obey the truth, for whose, uh, uh, for whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you. And, and what is this truth according to Paul? The truth is that the Jew in becoming a Christian need not become a Greek, nor the Greek a Jew. The slave might continue to serve his master, and male and female retained each its function in the ongoing stream of life. In other words, Paul is saying that you can carry on as you are. If you're Greek, there's no need to become a Jew. A significant dispensation, I write, given that a man converted to Judaism often had to submit to adult circumcision, and this is just the kind of thing that puts a guy off the whole thing, I write jokingly. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> that's a little bit of a sidebar. But I, I, I think this idea of... Um, you know, b biblical passages as being ghost, you know, kind of stand in or proxies for uh, statements in the Declaration of Independence or Constitution. It's a bit of a reach. Uh, I mean, for, for sure, there was a foundation to Judeo Christian, to our country in Judeo Christianity, but the founding fathers were mostly deists. And in any case, you can't make the argument from a, a reason point of view that, that my religion is, is the right one and, and, and yours is not. And therefore, we're going to build a country on that. You have to appeal strictly to the other person's rationality in order to build from there. Well, I would put it rhetorically. Uh, are we better off in a country where, say, a majority of people believes that we are all children of God without regard to uh, race, ethnicity, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? Or are we better off in a, a world where most people in our country believe that they are members of warring uh, tribes based on identity politics? And I think the question answers itself. We are not doing ourselves a favor by losing organized religion, especially in a country that is as diverse as ours. Yeah, maybe it's not either or, though, because somebody might counter, well, 9-11. These people were true believers. They absolutely believe they have the right religion, and they acted accordingly. So right. it can't be, I mean, it can't be that just that... <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, the fact that some people do heinous things doesn't negate the possibility of truth value in religion. I think yeah, that's so then, something that everybody can see. Yeah, so let's let's kind of wrap up by by looking at that, that larger epistemological question. How do you know which is the right religion? You know, so 
two billion Christians say, well, this is the right one. And, but, but a billion and a half Muslims go, no, no, this is the right one. And 13 million Jews go, no, no, but, you know, Judaism is the right one. And, and so on and so on. The numbers alone can't, can't be our, our guide. Um, so then how do you know, uh, short of, well, this is how I was born or this is where I was raised. This is what I believe because that's the way I was born. Short of that, how do you know? Well, that's a theological question, Michael. <laughs> yeah. What's interesting about the diversity of religions, from my perspective, is that there's something called the iron law of demography, or it has been described as an iron law of demography by Eric Kaufman, um, which is that religious people have more children than non-religious people. There is something about the loss of a transcendent horizon that changes people's perception of, of the future. Um, and it's reflected in things like a, a falling birth rate. In How the West Really Lost God, I turn that proposition upside down to say it's not that people have more children because they're religious. It could very well be that there's something about having larger and robust, more robust families that is making people more religious. That's a subversive thought in the context of modern sociology, and uh, I think that's the thought I would like to leave you with. Um, not because it's um, <clears throat> not because it's self-evident truth, but be th because I think meditating on it sheds some light on where we are now and why we're here. As yeah, in and why the United States looks the way it does now. Interesting. Yeah. I'd say from a pure social science point of view, you make a pretty good case for your reversing the causal arrow. Uh, although, of course, it's debatable because there's so many confounding variables at work at any one time. These are hard problems to solve. I guess just the last final thoughts here on, again, back to the difference between these empirical truths and maybe political truths and religious truths. I see these as different things that... Um, like on the abortion issue, we're never going to get a final consensus. What's the right answer? There is no right answer. It's, you know, it's, it, it comes down to where you draw the line, and therefore we're going to have a political issue about it. And and why? I presume you're you're a Christian, or let's just say a Christian believes Jesus uh, rose from the dead, was crucified, was dead, rose from the dead, and did this theologically for uh, atone for our sins. Okay, so. You know, a Jew says, well, that's a nice story. You know, we, we believe in the same God, and we actually think there's going to be a Messiah. We just don't think the carpenter from Nazareth was the person. Not the, look, look at the Old Testament passages that they call the Pentateuch. That, that, that isn't what is predicted. So you, you got it wrong. Now, who am I to assess whether you, the Christian, or my other friends, the Jew, who's the right one? I don't know. I'm not sure it's possible to, to determine that in any kind of empirical way. It's like, just that's what you believe, and this person believes that. The anthropologist from Mars that comes to study earthly religions is not going to know which is the right one. It's just these are kind of de determined ba based on birth and when you happen to have been born. You know, if you were born 3,000 years ago, you wouldn't be a Christian because there were no Christians. <laughs> so, you know, so much of this feels to me like it's in a different realm. Like, what's the, what's the right policy for immigration? Well, there's no right policy. It depends on the goals of the society and where you draw the line of how many to let in and on and on. It's more like that. Anyway, that's how I think about it. Well, about, about abortion, Michael, if, as you say, we'll never get a right answer, we don't know where to draw the line, then we should do what every other species would do and err on the side of life for our species. I think that uh, that argument has a claim on us, I think. Yes, and therefore the point, the moment of conception would be a, a, a reasonable place to draw the line. But my counter to that, then my concern is that men have always tried to lord it over women and control their reproductive choices, control their sexuality. And there's good evolutionary reasons why men are like that, but it's not that's not a good thing. And before contraception uh, and abortion, uh, you know, infanticide was quite common. So, and an uh, influential paper I read on this, I forget the authors now, it was called Hardness of Life, Not Hardness of Heart. That these women, they don't want to kill babies. They, you know, they, they, they're not genocidal maniacs. You know, they, they have a hard life. And before, you know, the modern world of 
where everybody's pretty prosperous now, you know, life was pretty grim for most people. You know, not, po poverty rates were like 90% of all of humanity before the 20th century. You know, so women were getting, were killing their infants because life was just too hard. It was just a triage. You just, we can't afford another one. You know, we've got six babies. We can't have a seventh, you know, whatever. They just didn't have the choices. So I, I'm, I'm sympathetic to women who, you know, just need to make their own economic and life choices, and who am I to tell them what they can and cannot do? As mentioned earlier, I'm sympathetic uh, to making society a safer place for women in all kinds of ways, because I think especially young women are jeopardized by forces that didn't exist before. Uh, one of them is omnipresent pornography, which is incredibly destructive, and now we have social science research on that. Um, I would also like women to make a, a, a countercultural pitch here. I, I'd like women to entertain the thought that the Christian view of marriage, especially, is ennobling and elevating. Uh, you know, in the Catholic Church, you can't have a valid marriage without the consent of both parties, for example. That puts men and women on a tacit, uh, equal moral footing. And that, I think, is another uh, good idea that uh, Christianity helped to usher in. In so many ways, Christianity is the wallpaper of, of our society. But the faster some of us are moving away from it, uh, the more we are seeing the kinds of problems that I'm trying to catalog in my work. And again, I, I do this kind of work because I think that the young especially are suffering the consequences of decisions made by previous generations concerning especially the sexual revolution, and that they need a name for that kind of suffering that is not a name that they know yet. And that's why I put those ideas out there. It's in the hopes of helping them. Yeah, good. I'm glad you said that because I, I got that from your, your books and, and your work in general. I think that's good. Um, but again, I think, you know, if we you know kind of treat charitably the people that launched the sexual revolution and, and no-fault divorce and things like that, I mean, there's a reason why divorce rates went up, at least in part, because a lot of people were in crappy, terrible, awful abuse of marriages, and the women couldn't get out. And so the law kind of followed the trends of the civil rights movement, like, well, women have, should have rights. You know, the famous story about Margaret Thatcher, as when she was prime minister, wouldn't have been able to get a home loan without her husband. You know, this is crazy. <laughs> you know, women should have these rights, darn it. So, and, and that includes the right to have sex if you want. You know, it's none of my business who you want to have sex with. But you're talking about larger social trends. You know, it's hard. It, these are hard factors to to uh, variables to control for to figure out which is the one that's causing it. I do think I, I agree with you. Families, the kind of family structure is important, and the breakdown of that is probably not good, whatever it's caused. Um, and not necessarily the not a 1950s nuclear family, but more of this, what we were talking about earlier, that kind of extended family is super important for everybody. So I'm going to leave it there. Uh, we could go on for hours and hours because there's so many really interesting social issues. We'll have you back when whatever your next book is. What, what are you working on now? I'm working on a memoir of upstate New York that would try to tell some of the story of America uh, through that lens, because it's a, mm. an area so rich with history, Michael, uh, from mm. the indigenous peoples on through the pre-revolutionary war into the Erie Canal and uh, right on up to white rural America today. So that's the hope. And thank you for asking. Oh, interesting. Okay. Well, thank you, Mary. Thanks for coming on the show.